Brian C. Jones, Senior Minister of the Newburgh Church of Christ here in beautiful Louisville, Kentucky. Listen, we had an awesome day of worship here at the Newburgh Church of Christ, and we want to invite you to listen and watch this sermon entitled, When Evening Comes. If you're going through some storms in your life, please make sure you watch this sermon in its entirety. It's guaranteed to bless your life. May God bless you. The gospel writer Mark, who is also referred to as John Mark, depicts and describes Jesus as a sovereign, suffering, serving savior who was intently desirous of accomplishing the will of his father. Brothers and sisters, Mark gives us Jesus' thesis statement in Mark chapter 10. And verse number 45, when he says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. With much precision, with much fluidity and rapidity. In chapter 1, Mark wastes no time recording Jesus calling some of his disciples into ministry. They were astonished, brothers and sisters, by Jesus teaching of the Jews and how he was casting out Jesus was unclean spirits and healing those who had all kinds of health maladies and diseases and people who were sick and demon possessed. In chapter two, we find that Jesus uh, has an encounter with a person because there were four men who were carrying a man on a pallet who was paralyzed and after this man had an experience and encounter with Jesus he was no longer paralyzed he was walking on his own carrying the same pallet to which at one point used to be carrying him in case you don't get it and you need the cliff notes once you have an encounter with Jesus after you leave you will leave better than what you did before you came to him. Amen, somebody. In chapter number three, we find that the Jews are confused at Jesus because Jesus is healing on the Sabbath day and he is calling all of his disciples into ministry in chapter four and verse number one. It's a powerful passage that I want to extrapolate for you because he says in verse number one, when you look at this passage, he, and he began to teach again by the sea and such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into the boat in the sea and sat down and the whole crowd was by the sea uh, on the land. Brothers and sisters, we need to know that on this particular day, Jesus was teaching, watch this, a large crowd. Somebody open up your mouth and say large crowd. Large. If you don't lie, just type in large crowd. Jesus is teaching a large crowd because his fame had arose in this particular area, and Jesus was teaching this crowd, and the crowd was so large that Jesus had to get in a boat and teach them inside of the boat, and they were still on land listening to Jesus. And Jesus began to teach them a series of parables. Open up your mouth and say parables. When you think about parables, think about comparables, because in parabolic teaching, it occurs when Jesus uses word pictures to explain to his audience what they would normally be familiar with to teach them a spiritual lesson so that they could understand it and apply it. You'll find in chapter number four, brothers and sisters, the Jesus teaching the parable of the sower and the soil, the parable of the seed and the parable of the mustard seed. Now, a sower sows the seed of the word. All right? The soil is the heart of the person who's receiving the seed which dictates and determines the fruitfulness of the seed. Right now, I'm in the pulpit just throwing seeds. I'm just throwing some seeds, and I'm hoping out there that I got some good soil because the soil is the heart of the person who's receiving the seed, which is the word of God. So Jesus, though he was an anointed Messiah and he had the oil, it all depends on the soil. Nobody in here right now. I said he was the anointed Messiah, so he had the oil, but when he was preaching the word and giving the seed of the word, it all depended upon the soil. And I hope and pray, wish and desire.
fire. And as I give you this seed, the word of God on today, that it falls on some good soil. Look at your neighbor and say, good soil, good soil, good soil. You want the word of God to fall on good soil because to that end, we find ourselves situated and in the culturation in Mark chapter 4 and verse number 35. And when you look at this passage, I want you to stay in this text with me. Because there's a word that God is going to give us today that's going to bless your life in this passage. So I want you to stay with me, beloved, in verse number 35 of Mark chapter 4. The Bible says on that day, the question is what day? The same day that Jesus was, Jesus was teaching in a boat. And they were on the land listening to the words of Jesus Christ as he taught them that very same day where he gave them a series of parables, comparables, so they could understand that he wanted the word of God to fall on the right soil. The Bible says on that day, that same day, when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. I've tried to help you understand that it's the very same day that they were taught the word by the word. Are y'all with me on this morning? They found themselves in a place where they needed to apply what they were just taught. Ooh, I want to park, pause, and preach here for just a moment, beloved. Y'all pray for me. We need to learn information practically instead of merely learning information theoretically. In other words, when you hear the word of God, you ought to be listening as you're taught so that you can be learning practically. Meaning that when I hear it, I'm looking for ways and opportunities in my life where I can apply this word to my life. When you just learn the word of God theoretically, you're just satisfied and happy because you know something new. But you don't look for opportunities to apply it. Oh, let me break it down this way. I, I, I can remember back in the days when there was a teacher that would give us a pop quiz. Anybody remember anything like that? And, and, and it taught us that you have to know the answer before the text comes. And when something unexpected occurs in your life and you find yourself tested, if you have learned while the teacher was teaching, you will know what to do practically so you don't have to waste your time panicking. You don't worry about the pop quiz. You don't worry about the test when it comes unexpectedly because you were listening to the teacher and you understood what the teacher was teaching. And by the time you got the test, you already knew the answers because you were listening when you got taught. Do I have anybody in this place on today? So you don't have to get ready if you stay ready. Look at your neighbor and say, stay ready, stay ready, stay ready, stay ready, because there's a test that's going to come in your life. And I want to help somebody understand that in this same passage, stay in the Bible with me. The Bible says on that day when evening came, somebody shout when evening came. Evening. Okay, I'm feeling my help coming. Uh, when evening came. And if I had to tag this teaching with a text and a title, it would simply be when evening comes. When evening comes. Can't you see the picture in your mind, can't you see the imagery in your spirit? Jesus is on the boat and he's teaching on the very same day. He gave them a series of parables and all of a sudden Jesus says, uh, let's go to the other side. Uh, the Bible says when evening came, you, you remember evening, don't you? Uh, evening is the time between the afternoon uh, and the night. It's the time when the sun goes down. Light begins to fade. There is an anticipation that night is coming. I can remember when I was a little boy playing basketball up the hill from my house at my friend's house, but when the evening came, my mama would say, Brian, it's time to come home because it was still evening and she wanted me to be home before it got dark. So if you stay with me in this text, I need you to know what's going on on this day. The Bible says when evening comes, and notice what Jesus says. I'm still in verse number 35, but let me pray for me. The Bible says, Jesus said to them, let's go over to the other side. Ooh, ooh, that's good preaching. Jesus says, let's go to the other side. Okay, you don't get it yet. Jesus said, let's go to the other side, which tells us that when Jesus says, let's go, you don't have to worry about getting there. 
no matter what happens after Jesus said, let's go to the other side. If you were the one to whom he was talking to, you don't have to worry about anything. Notice your Bible in verse number 36. He says, after he said, let's go to the other side, the Bible says, leaving the crowd. If you're online, just type in leaving the crowd. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> leaving the crowd. In other words, he's in this boat teaching these people helping them but once he finishes his lesson he got in the, he was still in the boat and he told them those disciples who were with him and those who were in other boats let us go to the other side and then he left the crowd if you let, 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 let me tell you something church you can't get to the other side if you remain attached to the same crowd who praised you at one point loved you at one point and needed you at some point because some folks in the crowd have a individual personal agenda a separate agenda than just hearing your teacher they have some personal priorities that you can fulfill uh, on your mission with them but you can't get to the other people if you stay with one crowd, are y'all in this place? Let me come home. One click. Oh, God. One crew. Because there's somebody, somebody shout somebody. There's somebody, beloved, on the other side that could use your help too. There's somebody on the other side that needs some love from you too. There's somebody on the other side that needs your teaching. So once you have made a deposit in the crowd and taught them and built relationships with them, you can leave that crowd. And I, I think that's part of the problem with some of our young people. They won't leave the crowd. There's something no good. Leave the crowd where all they do is gossip and complain and do wickedness, leave the crowd because in some crowds and some crews and some cliques, all you hear is verbal pollution Amen. from people who never seek victorious Amen. solutions. Amen. So the Bible says, leaving the crowd. Notice what happened in this transition. They were headed to the other side. But church, Newburgh Nation, they found themselves in a storm. Has anybody ever experienced a storm? I want to ask that question one more time. Has anybody ever experienced a storm? The Bible says in verse number 37, beloved, and there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up it is perceived that they were in an open fishing boat that had low sides. And as the waves are breaking because of this fierce wind, they found themselves in a storm. And if you've been through a storm in your life, traveling on the sea of your life, you may understand what I'm about to tell you, beloved, because there's a misconception that just because you are with Jesus, that you may be exempt from storms. I'm riding with Jesus. I'm riding with Jesus. I'm riding with Jesus. Yeah, even if you're riding with Jesus, even if Jesus knows you, even if you're in the same boat with Jesus, you're still going to go through some storms. Uh, in your life, the boat was filling up with water so they could have potentially capsized. And can I tell you, uh, in 2020 and in 2021, if you've been alive and living, you've been through some storms in your life. Corona was a storm that devastated the world. We had many coronavirus deaths. We were in a global pandemic. It was very difficult for people to change their routines and get into a new online routine where you began to worship God from a computer or a laptop of your uh, smart TV or your phone. And it was a difficult adjustment.
adjustment because we were not around the people of God. You didn't have uh, the sister who always checked up on you to see your face every week. Amen, somebody. You didn't have somebody giving you that hug and that handshake and you could cry your tears on their shoulder because at one point we couldn't even come out of the house. It was people were buying up all of the toilet tissue. And me and my wife, I'm so happy she liked to go to Sam's because we laughed us a few months. Amen, somebody. And people were dying. And guess what? I'm the preacher and I couldn't even go to the hospital. The building was closed. We had to go to funeral homes to do funerals. We were not able to hug people. People were having respiratory issues. Coronavirus was a storm. That's why it does not make no sense to have survived it and not be willing to come in church and give God some thanksgiving and some glory that you survived the storm, you survived the coronavirus storm. Some of you had the coronavirus. Some of you had pneumonia, but you survived, you survived. Just somebody open up your Bible and shout, I'm a survivor, I'm a survivor. Long before Beyonce and Destiny Child, we got some survivors in this place. But people were devastated because you may have survived, but you may have lost someone that didn't make it. And the pain and the grief of that loss has been a very, very, very difficult storm. And we don't want to mull over this point because this church needs to be a beacon of healing. We don't need to be all over each other. A house divided against itself would never stand. We ought to be so excited and happy to come to worship God, the God that saved us from sin, the God that helped us transform our lives, the God that saw something good in us when we couldn't see any good in ourselves. Many of you may have thought you may die. But just open up your Bible and shout, I'm still alive, I'm still alive, I'm still alive. Give God glory if you are breathing God's oxygen and you know you're still alive and you made it through a storm. Praise God. The Bible says that they had a fierce gale of wind. And I thought that I would ask the church, what winds have deterred you from making it to the other side? Has it been relationship winds? Winds of doubt in your storm, winds of discouragement in your storm, winds of defeat, winds of procrastination. Oh, let me go low here. Winds of laziness. See, some of you can't make it to the other side, and it's not nobody else's fault but yours. But you've allowed procrastination to be a wind that has deterred you. I wish I had some honest folk in here. If you can't say amen to that, just say ouch. And many of us have endured winds of frustration and fear because I've never seen so many people ask questions about death and what happens after people die because all you saw on the news is death and hospital didn't even have enough room anymore and they were holding the bodies at places that, that, that the, the loved ones couldn't even give them a proper burial. And when I look back over our lives and we made it through all that, uh, that was a storm, beloved. Amen, somebody. And we're grateful to God that we made it beyond that. But here's what I want to tell you on today so you will know what the sermon was about. As we talk about when evening comes, here it is. I want you to know this and I never want you to forget it. And I want you to internalize what I'm, what I'm saying. You can make it to the other side. You can make it to the other side. Third time's a charm. You. Some of y'all just don't look. Maybe it's your mask. It, you just don't look like you believe it, but I feel like I gotta say it again. You can make it to the other side. Now, they were in fear, um, but I don't know why they were in fear because Jesus himself was in the stern of the ship. But maybe they were in fear because Jesus was asleep in the stern. 
and many people are mad about the storms because it feels like Jesus is asleep. Jesus ain't moving. And you're crying because you're trapped in the storm. And you like Christ? Okay, I, I pay tithes, Christ. I kept the church going in the pandemic, Lord. Why, why, are you, why are you allowing me to go through this storm? And we accuse Jesus sometimes of not caring because we go through storms. Am I right about it? Yeah. Now, Jesus, the text doesn't tell us that Jesus was the pilot. Obviously, he was not the pilot because he was asleep. But if you are the pilot and Jesus seems to be a passenger, you should feel somewhat uncomfortable. But can I tell somebody something? It's going to free you today. Even when Jesus appears to be a passenger on a boat, he's always the pilot. I wish I knew somebody knew that Jesus is the master of the sea. Amen, somebody. So just because you don't see Jesus moving like you want him to move. In the midst of your storm, he's still in control. He's still the pilot of your boat, the pilot of your ship. And I don't want nobody to lose hope in Christ. I don't want anybody to lose faith in Jesus because you feel like he's dormant. His activity is dormant because he's asleep. And I don't want you to allow Jesus' sleep pattern to cause you to think he's not with you. Right. Amen, meant somebody. Yeah. Now I want you to notice this. Notice Jesus' position, his posture, and his peace. <laughs> oh, this is so good. Now, now watch this. Jesus, in the midst of a storm, disciples are losing their mind. Water is filling the boat. They feel like they're on the brink of sinking and dying. And Jesus Christ, the Messianic Master, is asleep yeah. story. In other words, Jesus was in a comfortable position. The text even says on a cushion. You know, that's some good sleep when you get your favorite pillow. Can I, can I get somebody in here can testify? Anybody had some good sleep before? And you, it, it was what you call... We used to call it a power nap. Oh, I ain't got nobody in there. Power nap. So Jesus' position, he's in the stern of the ship asleep. His posture is he's okay. And Jesus is at peace because he's the prince of peace. See, here, here's what I believe happened, church. I believe that Jesus, I want you to catch this. Jesus wanted his disciples to have practical confidence in his supernatural and miraculous ability without the initial response of fear. Okay. I believe that after Jesus taught them those series of parables in that boat, he wanted them to feel confident and have what I call practical confidence. Which means that if I find myself in a storm, because of my knowledge of who Jesus yeah. is, and what I believe about Jesus. And if I find myself in the storm, I don't go crazy and lose hope and lose faith because I don't respond in fear when I know who Jesus is and I know his ability. So I'm going to practically be confident in my messianic master's ability when I go through a storm. That's why you don't leave the church. That's why you don't give up hope when you hear the doctor say something you don't want to hear them say. That's why you don't give up on Jesus Christ when you go in the storm because I have practical confidence that I know what to do in a storm because I've been taught by the messianic master. So I believe that Jesus' comfortability came because he had taught them. He had sown the word in them. All right? Now, unfortunately, they responded with fear. The disciples were thinking fatality and calamity. Jesus is thinking spirituality, practicality, and vitality. In other words, Jesus, once he teach you, he expects you 
to have practical confidence in what he has taught you so you're not like everybody else who doesn't have any hope and always goes to fear when you enter into a storm. Oh, God. So the question is, if you're in a storm, what are you worried about? <laughs> Y'all all right? You know Jesus, don't you? See, in this kind of teaching, it's home because the question is, what are you crying over? In other words, why are you so afraid? The question is, are you really truly riding with Jesus? They were in a boat traveling and riding with Jesus, and they had fear. In other words, when you know Jesus is with you, you no longer have to be worried about the storms in your life because Jesus said, let's go to the other side. And if Jesus says, let's go, you have his permission. Amen, somebody. You have his permission to go to the other side. You have his purpose. Because for Jesus to say, let's go to the other side, it, it shows us that we have a purpose for going to the other side. And thirdly, you have Jesus' presence. Do you hear those P words? They start with the P, so I'm hoping that you can remember them. Amen, somebody. You have his permission, his purpose, and his presence. Let's try it together. You have his permission, his purpose, and his presence, third time the trump, you have his permission, his purpose, and his presence. Amen. So why are you worried about your storm? <laughs> why are you worried about your other storm? Because what's going to help us get to the other side is faith. Somebody shout faith. Amen. The question is, why is it important to make it to the other side? Have you ever thought about that in this text? Why was it so important to make it to the other side after Jesus got finished teaching in the boat? And I want you to know that Jesus has power over outcomes. Anybody here got some upcoming decisions to make in your life? Come on in here, church. Can you preach amen this morning? Let, let me tell you something about Jesus. Jesus controls outcomes and incomes. He has power over your condition. Watch this. He has power in the spoken word. The word of Jesus Christ is so powerful that the wind and the sea heard his word and they did what Jesus told them to do. Jesus has power over the elements. Jesus has power. Watch this. I want you to get this part. In his word. And when you know the power in the word of God, it can change the way you feel. It can change your attitude. It can change your outlook on life. It can change whether or not you have faith or fear. Fear is the antithesis of faith which means it's the opposite of faith. Amen, somebody. I just need you to know for those of you who are in a storm right now, or maybe you're worried about somebody else who is in a storm right now, you just need to know that Jesus has power in his word. That's why you can never put down your Bible, because there's power in the word. And I tried to help you understand that if we do not make it through a storm, if we don't make it through a storm, church, then God can't get us to the people that are on the other side. Y'all hear me on today? I want you to know, beloved, part of the reason why it's imperative and important for us to get to the other side through a storm is that there's some people over there. Somebody shout some people, some people. Somebody shout some people. There's some people on the other side of the storm. And if you're in a boat with Jesus and Jesus is asleep, he's expecting somebody to have enough faith to get him to the other side. 
Because if you have enough faith to make it through your storm, you can get to the other side. And there's some people on the other side that need to hear and know Jesus. So your storm is just something that the devil uses to derail your destiny. How many of you who've lost time off of your life because the devil sent a storm? And because of the storm, you got distracted from your focus, distracted from coming to church, distracted from your Bible reading, distracted from what God wants you to do. And you allow the storm in your life to shift your life. And all of a sudden, a week has went by. I'm preaching already, whether you say amen or not. A month has went by and a year can go by. And all because you allowed a storm to distract you in your life so you couldn't make it to the other side. But I believe we have about 50 people in the New Bird Church of Christ, even on today, that have enough faith in the middle of a storm to know you're going to push forward and make it to the other side because there's somebody on the other side I got to get Jesus to. Give God some glory in this place. If you're going to make it, make it, make it to the other side. Give God glory. Now, if we don't make it to the other side of this sea, we won't get, I want you to catch this, we won't get Jesus to a man who's going through a storm. He looked like he crazy. This man is having a mental breakdown. He, he, the devil has a demon uh, so deep in him that this man is cutting himself with some stones. The man is not even at a basketball or a football game, but he's hollering to the top of his lungs and he's screaming, albeit naked. Okay, okay. Y'all don't know. Y'all look at me like y'all don't know what naked means. Don't have me go there. We got kids in here. Praise God, praise God, praise God. He don't have on no clothes, church. And this man is out of his mind and he's screaming. And I don't want you to look negatively at this man because many a times we see the results of somebody's behavior, but we don't know the conditions that cause them to be crazy. You don't know what they went through with their parents. You don't know what they went through with their cousins. You don't know what they went through in their homes. You don't know what they went through in their family. You don't know what they went through on their job. You don't know what they went through in their relationship. You don't know what they went through with their kids or their marriage. Don't look at them crazy. Because all of us have demonstrated some similar behavior. Like this man had. But can I tell you something, beloved? If you allow the storm to cause you to have fear, and don't believe and reach out to Jesus in the middle of your storm, you won't make it to the other side. Because the reason why the devil wants to use a storm to distract you, it's bigger than just you. Somebody just shot, it's bigger than me, it's bigger than me, it's bigger than me, it's bigger than me. There's somebody who's going through something, and what Jesus wants to do is use your storm experiences. And the tornadic nature of your storm, so that when somebody else, I'm preaching much better than you're responding, is going through a storm, you'll be able to show them how you made it over, how you got through, how God blessed you to get to the other side. But if you don't make it, you can't help the other person on the other side. Because, because the storms that you and I go through sometimes are never really about us. It's only that God chose you and allowed you to go through a storm. Come here, somebody, lean in. Because he had enough confidence. I feel like running around this pulpit in you. That if he allowed you to go through a storm, you was going to make it through with faith so that when he got you to the other side, you'll be able to give a testimony about how you made it through the other side of the storm in your life. Would you do me a favor and open up your mouth and give God some glory that you made it through some storms in your life? And though the storm tried to kill you and distract you from your destiny, you had enough faith in Jesus Christ to make it on the other side. Oh God, thank you for my storm because... Hindsight is 2020. 
Had you not went through that storm, you would have not been the person that you are today. And sometimes we have these frivolous conversations where we tell people, if I had to do it all over again, no. If you had to do it all over again, you would have messed something up. You may be happy you went through that storm five years ago because you wouldn't be the person today if you didn't go through what you went through back then. Do I have a witness in this place? And, and God wants to use your story. So I wonder, as I hasten to close, I wonder why Jesus fell asleep. I just, I just wonder why he fell asleep. Was it because he needed some rest? Was it because he was extremely tired? We all know what that feels like. Maybe, and this leads into my spirit, I pray you can receive it. Maybe he was so comfortable in that storm because he was sovereign. But God gave me this notion, and I pray you can receive this. Maybe Jesus fell asleep in the boat during the storm because he trusted that the men on that boat would get him to the other side despite the storm. What I'm trying to tell you, beloved, is I believe Jesus trusts you. I believe that Jesus trusts you and me. And it's not punishment, it's preparation. It's not punishment, it's preparation. Because for where God wants to take you in your life, if he gave you that blessing without going through a storm, you would not have developed the experience to handle the blessing that he wants to give you. So he keeps you in the oven longer than what you want. Because you see people with microwave blessings and you forget that God operates in a crock pot. And you're complaining about how long he has you in the crock pot. But what you don't know, he's tenderized. <laughs> Bro, while I'm about to take off, dog, you better come get me. He's tenderizing you, beloved. There's some stuff you don't know that you're going to need to know, but you won't know it until you go through that friction in that relationship. You won't know it until you've had so much on your shoulders with that boss that it just feels like can't stand you. I ain't talking to nobody on today. You're going through so much with that child in your life, and you've done all you could, but going through what you went through with that child prepared you for your grandchild. See, it's not punished. Just open up your Bible and say it with me. It's not punishment. It's preparation. One more time. It's not. One more time. It's not. There's somebody on the other side of that sea that's expecting you to make it through whatever storm you're going through right now. And I believe that Jesus trusted his disciples, although they responded with fear, because G Jesus said, hush, be still. You know, that blesses me, because when the devil is all in my mind trying to deter me and distract me with stuff that ain't got nothing to do with kingdom, Am I the only one? And, and I have to remind myself about the word. Because, because when the devil is bombarding your spirit with lies and evil and wickedness and stuff, you ought not be thinking of and you have to repent of your thoughts because I can't believe that just popped in my mind. I was just working on a sermon and just prayed and he popped up in my mind. You ain't going to make it through Corona. Newberg ain't going to make it through 15 months of being out and the devil is just hitting you, stabbing you in your mind and you got to pray through it and you got to think through it and plan through it. And am I the only one in here that's dealing with demonic warfare every now and then? And I have to think about the word. I have to think about what Jesus said. I have to think about my destiny. And so many of us, let me just give you this illustration. A few weeks ago, I was uh, exercising and jogging uh, like I was yesterday, some of y'all saw my video 
I was trying to encourage y'all to come to church. Amen. I'm so glad you're here today. Maybe you got the point. Thank God. Praise God. And I was, I was exercising. I was running in our neighborhood. And there was, a, there was an African-American brother about 50 yards in front of me. And I was, you know, they say, you know, I got, I'm a basketball player, so I got bad knees. So I, I shouldn't even be walking or running on the pavement. But I was running on the pavement uh, at some point. But then I decided to get into the grass. And about 50 yards ahead of me, there was a brother that was waving his hands like him. He said, hey, hey, I had on my headphones. He was like, hey, hey. He said, stop, man. He said, get out the grass. Get out the grass. He says, it's snakes in there. I was so scared, my heart would be, I said, oh. And I got on the pavement. He said, brother, I was just walking in the grass, and I saw two snakes in there. And, and I thought to myself, when you're trying to do all you can for God, you're just trying to be the best man, woman, boy, girl that you can be. Sometimes when you're traveling in life, there's going to be some snakes in the grass. And if you're not careful, those snakes can become a snare and a storm in your life. But you got to do what the man told me, get out the grass. Get, so you hanging, I can't hear nothing in here. You're hanging in around some voices and some people and all they want is to see your downfall. They don't want to truly see your elevation and some people are only hanging on your coattail for what they can get because people have a personal agenda. And the faster you learn it, the better. Just look at your neighbor and say, get out the grass, get out the grass, get out the grass, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of us have experienced it because he don't want you to make it to the other side because there's some people that God wants you to help on the other side. But if you just keep living in the grass and staying in the grass, you get bit by a snake, you get bit by another snake, and you forget all about making it to the other side because you're in the, you're in the wrong place, you're in the grass. Got to get out that grass. Let me give you a few principles and I got to wrap it up. I'm done. After these principles, I'm closing. Here it is. Number one, here's what we can learn. When you look at this Bible, you'll find, I don't have time, but when you go home, I want you to read the next chapter. Because in the next chapter, you'll find a demon-possessed man on the other side. Well, I'll tell you what, let's just go ahead and do this. I, I don't want you to take my word for it. Uh, when you look at verse number one of Mark chapter five, the Bible says, they came to the other side of the sea. See, that was, I really thought I was going to get more from you. Yeah. Oh, can, can I read it one more time? Y'all holding up my sermon. I'm trying to let you go. I know many of y'all got stuff to do. They came to the other side of the sea. I take it. Into the country of the Gerasenes. And he got out of the boat, and immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with the chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken into pieces, and no one was strong enough to consume him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and the mountains and gashing himself with stone. See, I told you, if you don't make it to the other side, you won't accomplish the mission that Jesus has for you because you allowed the storm to cause you to be stuck in the storm. So observation number one, as I close, navigate through your storms with a Christ-centered purpose. That's rich. Just don't have time. Number two, traveling with Jesus doesn't exempt you from storms. All right? Number three, God uses storms to direct you into your purpose. Any Bible readers remember, and I'm trying to quit, that, that there's a man by the name of Jonah in the Old Testament Hebrew Bible that was on a ship going in the wrong direction. But God caused a storm in his life to redirect Jonah to go in the direction that God had for him. See, God sent Jonah to Nineveh, but Jonah was in a ship headed to Tarshish. Amen, somebody. What are you saying, Brother Jones? God knows how to use a storm to redirect you into your purpose. There's a man by the name of the Apostle Paul, who was a talented uh, theological tent maker from Tarsus, 
and we find that the apostle Paul was on a ship headed to Rome, but God allowed Paul and 275 other people to go through a storm on that ship, and God allowed Paul to even be shipwrecked to get them to an island because there were some people on an island that God wanted Paul to help. Amen, somebody. And many times, uh, your storm is not just about your pain, it's about your purpose. The storm is less about your pain, it's more about your purpose. I gotta get out of here. Uh, number four, you can make it through your storm with Jesus, but it's hard to make it without him. Don't try it. Five, travel with Jesus' permission. Let us go to the other side. Jesus' purpose on the other side, there is a man. Jesus' presence, he'll be with you. Observation number six, someone's survival, catch this, and sanity is dependent upon you making it to the other side. Listen, I want you to hear me clearly, beloved. It's somebody you know that's on the verge of giving up on life because of their personal storm. And what they may be going through, they could be going through and experiencing and encountering something that God has allowed you to overcome. But if you don't make it through your storm, you'll never be able to get to them so you can tell them how they can make it. Amen, somebody. So somebody is about to lose their mind and go crazy on the other side. But you got to make it through your storm so you can get over there to help them. Last one and I'm done. There's power in the word of your pilot, who is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Here's your application. Obey Jesus. Yeah. Have faith in Jesus. And if the wind and the sea had enough faith to obey Jesus, the men and the women of the New World Church of Christ and the boys and girls should be able to obey Jesus. You can make it to the other side with faith, but you can't make it with fear. Sometimes we have a film done. Sometimes we have a fear about coming to Jesus and changing our lives. Because everybody's dressed up. We don't know what people are going through, some, some of us specifically. So sometimes the hardest thing in the world is to walk down the aisles at church and say, my life is messed up. But you, we don't, we could see beyond your suit, brothers, your tie and your mask. Sisters, we can see beyond your dress, your high heels, and your hat. Because by the time you walked in here, everybody has been through a storm. You're either in a storm right now, coming out of a storm, or going into a storm. But you can make it through your storms. So you can get to the other side if you know Jesus. So how about it, y'all? I just want you to hold on and trust, have faith in Jesus that you can make it to the other side, even in the midst of your storm. Maybe salvation has been a storm for somebody today. And the hardest thing for you is to make up your mind to get rid of all the sin in your life because you've gotten comfortable with sin. Feels good to say what you want to say, do what you want to do, behave the way you want to behave, and, and just live in the flesh. But you can't make it to heaven that way, beloved. Jesus died so, to give you another way. In other words, here's what Jesus wants to do. He wants you to begin the process of living a transformed life. But here's when that starts. By believing with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is indeed the resurrected Savior. Repent of your sins. Make up your mind to go in a different direction. Confess Jesus as God in your life and your Lord and you have to do something. If one person does it, I guarantee you somebody else will do it. Walk down these aisles. Come to the front row and decide that this is the day that I give my life to Jesus Christ and I become a Christian. And you have to be baptized according to Acts twenty two sixteen. Why tarry is that? Why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling the name of the Lord. I did that September 3rd, 1997 and the world ain't been the same since. And I was so happy that I got all my sins washed away, all the guilt, all the shame washed away and I didn't do nothing to get it. All I did was obey Jesus when he told me to be baptized. And from that moment on, God had a calling and a plan for my life. I believe God has the same thing for you. So at this
this time, for those of you who are already members of the Lord's Church, God wants to add someone new to the church today. If you need to be baptized, we're going to ask you to stand in just a moment. As Brother Wise comes, we're going to ask you to stand in just a moment. And we want you to come to these front rows right here. And Brother Wise will assist you. But if you're a child of God and you know you're in a storm, we want you to hold on and have faith. And believe that if you have faith in Jesus, God will bless you to make it through this storm. How about it, church? Let's stand to your feet. 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 Stand to your feet, everybody. And if you're online, all you have to do is contact us at NewburgCLCLouisville at gmail.com or call us at 502-966-5171, and you can be saved today as well. We're going to sing a song to encourage you to come. If today is your day to walk in front of all of these people and give your life to Jesus, you ought to do it today so you can be saved and forgiven of sin. Listen, if you're in a storm right now, I'm so happy that we got Jesus Christ in our lives. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and hit that share button, and share the message with somebody who's going through a storm where they're experiencing evening in their lives. Hope and pray this bless your life. May God bless you.